third session. It's going to be moderated by, by Margaret Chowning, the professor. I'm not going to introduce her. She gave a paper yesterday. You know who she is. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to session three, Religion, Politics, and Armed Rebellion. Um, I'm Margaret Chowning in the History Department, uh, and I have the pleasure to introduce first Brian Connaughton from uh, the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Iztapalapa. Uh, Brian is the author of many important articles, uh, important books in both Spanish and English, including uh, Ideología y Sociedad en Guadalajara, which was translated into English as clerical ideology. I don't have it. Oh, here. Uh, clerical ideology and in the revolutionary in the age. Revolutionary age uh, Sorry, I thought I had a, had a good edit of your extra long CV. Um, and Brian is also, um, in my estimation, uh, a heroic editor of collected essays uh, that have really shaped the field of late colonial, uh, early uh, post-independence Mexico. And I think that service to the profession is um, not maybe as important as his own monographic work, but certainly bears um, mention. So, Brian, Brian Connaughton. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret and uh, Charles and Liz and everyone here at the University of California who've uh, made this event possible. And uh, to all of you here present today on Saturday morning, which is a heroic on your part. Uh, I called uh, what I'm going to uh, present to you uh, as a question, conjoined, subservient, or autonomous, and then religion, church, and rule in independent Mexico, in which I've tried to synthesize some of the work that I've been doing over the last several years um, to propose that independence is associated in Mexico with a major breakdown of the equation of uh, church, uh, state, and religion. Probably the independence of Mexico should be seen as a crucial but not simply determining a, in a major shift in the role of religion and the church in Mexican society. They no longer fit almost naturally and with little discussion into the fiber of state and society. Initially and during the greater part of the colonial period, the model for church-state relations was mutuality crown and altar joined in a common task of leading society. Distinct systems of law highlighted separateness, yet were overcome through the dual role of the king as secular ruler and protector of the church. The rationale of state and empire was expressed in Christian ideals, and the clergy still in the forefront of knowledge, whether in the theory of state, higher education, the definition of mankind in an expanding world, or the linguistic exploration of human diversity. The ideal of church and state conjoined in the common tasks of the Spanish monarchy was not easily maintained over the three centuries of co colonial rule. Numerous conflicts had to be resolved, jurisdictional, economic, educational, and social matters involving religion, the clergy, state officials, and civic society had to be attended, including the duties of the Spanish monarchy in relation to the Holy See. While an initial concordat between Castile and Rome in 1418 had begun the formal solution of such problems, there were few fixed formulas or even an unquestioned framework for such solutions. Friction built up between Spanish officialdom and the Holy See from the late 16th century, and several outstanding conflicts took place in the 17th century. By the early 1700s, tensions were running high, 
policy, policy statements were being written and official complaints against the, against the Holy See were being set out. The search for original documents which would substantiate this quest for a new relationship with Rome began in earnest and would be characteristic of the 18th century, including four different concordats in 1714, 1737, and 53 that still failed to achieve a definitive settlement. Not even the 1753 concordat, which re recognized in, Span in the Spanish monarch his greatest powers over the Spanish church, was enough for the royal administration, and conflict would continue up to the independence of Mexico. The consummation of Mexican independence in 1821 would come in the midst of a major conflict between the Spanish liberal Cortes in, in Madrid and the Holy See. While Lu Lucas Aleman and other historians saw this as a sign that Mexico had broken with the high-handedness of the church reformers in Spain and thus set a distinctive path for Mexico in ecclesiastical matters, hindsight suggests otherwise. It is true that many people in Mexico at the time believed it to be so. As late as 1851, Melchor Ocampo stated that independent Mexico had given the church far greater liberty than it previously enjoyed. But probably another mid-century author was closer to the truth when he stated that Mexican independence had not established any clear position for the church within the political settlement or settlements after 1821. This can be seen as an accident or oversight, but it would probably be best understood as a standoff between opposite views among Mexican politicians, public intellectuals, and clerics, some of whom played all three roles at once. To put it succinctly, some imagined a model of church-state relations which would go even beyond the 1753 Spanish Concordat and make the church subservient to temporal needs, a clearly defined room within the total state edifice, as William Taylor pointed out, as part of the general a thrust of the Bourbon reforms. Others, clerics in particular, held on to the vague wish that independence would somehow free the church just, it, just as it had the Mexican people as a whole. But did they really conceive an, 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 an autonomous church or simply one that would be more, which would more freely join with the state and common national goals? It was very common in early independent Mexico for clerical thinkers to point up their progressive histories in the Cadiz Cortes of 1810 to 1814, or during the independence movement from 1810 to 21, or in the first national congresses of the 1820s. This would su suggest that they believed in the union of state and church, nation and faith, while assuming that a new and appropriate equation was being worked out. Yet it is probably safe to say that independence was the death blow for the church-state solution as it existed down to 1821 and made faith-based politics exceedingly treacherous even while constitutions, official protocols, imaginaries, and patriotic discourse all persisted in perpetuating a confessional state, a Catholic nation, and a sense of destiny and national purpose expressed in Christian notions of providence, mystical union and filial bonds. In this sense, a tension between a state-driven responsibility for socioeconomic and cultural development, already clearly present in the Bourbon reforms and promoted by the advancement of a novel type of disciplined social thinking associated with a, in quotes, new science of political economy came to the fore as Mexico saw itself in the critical process of state formation after 1821. Within this context, fertile ground for misunderstandings, different schools of thinking in Mexico, clearly related to the opposing views in Spain in the time of the Concordats, as well as during the Cortes of 1810 to 14 and 1810 to 23, stood each other off in the decades that followed. The model of conjoined destinies had become contentious in the 18th century and ruptured more fully in the Spanish Cortes of 1820 to 23 and with Mexican independence, leaving only the, option of the options of subservience or autonomy for the church. 
A delicate and fragile alternative to these extremes was a free association. Only in the 1850s did a few laymen and clerics pose with increasing clarity a way out of this morass. Complete separation of church and state or clear autonomy for the church based on the idea that it was a perfect society in terms of its, in terms of its capacity to govern its own destinies. But this last solution was not fully a proposal for separation since its proponents demanded religious exclusivity, state protection, and historical privileges for the church. Uh, a large part of the church-state problem was that legitimacy and effective government were still conceived of as demanding religious sanction, and, religion, and religious sanction was seen as requiring the stamp of approval of the clerical establishment. Additionally, in a long-standing Catholic society in which social approval, political rights, and religious orthodoxy were bound together, it was extremely difficult to separate off state and church as two distinct entities, as we custom customarily do today. All Mexicans made up the church, while clerics were only a small segment of society. Equally, clergy and the institutional church were commonly conceived of as within the state or part of the state. It was a chicken and egg solution. All Mexicans were within the state and all citizens were within the church. How is it possible to say which came first? During the first four decades after Mexican independence in 1821, the major question asked was not how to separate church and state, although that's often the, the question we ask today, but rather what orientation to give to the state religion. From the more liberal perspective, would it be wedded to liberalism or would it be ultramontane, backward looking, and tied to reactionary or conservative social groups nationally and internationally? And this last uh, question of an international uh, link was much more prominent at the time than has been uh, drawn up in the historiography. From the view of the established church, what degree of autonomy would the clergy maintain in their relationship to the state? From the standpoint of traditionalists or eventually conservatives, a position not easily taken in the years immediately following separation from Spain, would religion play its due role as the symbol and forger of everyday ties among a disparate population? If we, jumped at, if we jump ahead to the mid-century, only, only in the light of such dynamics does it become possible to understand the unwillingness of the liberal constitutional congressmen of 1856 to accept a, pro, a proposed article for the new constitution, originally Article 15, which would have separated church and state, maintaining only a privileged but not exclusive position for Catholicism. Equally, the correspondence and negotiations between the common fort government and church representatives right up to the eve of the revolution of December 17, 1857, against the new constitution would make no sense. The proposal within the Common Fort government to constitutionally guarantee sacraments to all citizens, independent of their political views or whether they declared their allegiance to the Constitution, would lose all context entirely. And the decision by the national government to install a public defender of the religious rights of citizens in early 1857 would simply seem absurd. 1856 to 1857 then marked a major point of inflection, but the conflict had been brewing with varying intensity from the 18th century, with the years of insurgency between 1810 and 21 adding to the tension. Because it was in those years that it was first revealed that the religious beliefs of all people in Mexico lacked a single meaning shared by all at the level of politics and identity. That religion and the clergy <clears throat> that, re that religion and the clergy were not perceived as identical, nor was religion understood as only undergirding obedience. Ecclesiastical history, canon law, moral and dogmatic theology, as well as religious musings on political and social injustices could be brought to bear in popular rebellion. First in the Constitution of Cadiz in 1812, then in Apatzingan in 1814, Catholicism became a pillar of the political system in the Spanish Empire and Mexico. This was repeated in the Federal Republican Constitution of 1824. Contrary to what many people must have desired, by making Catholicism constitutional 
It also made it a central part of public debate and a necessary template in the formation of public opinion. For religious perceptions could, could alter the flow of political events and the development of national identity. Thus, a current of Catholic thought, which was increasingly critical, frequently anti-clerical, and keen on citizenship, became a constant companion to rising liberalism. In this sense, Mexican liberal Catholicism became part of the tradition of contractual politics. And not only could the, could the body politic adjust political constitutions to the tenor and needs of the time, times, breaking new ground to deepen federalism or to ensure greater human liberties, but religion could be updated to emphasize its libertarian qualities. In this way, liberal Catholic writers and politicians such as Mariano Otero could insist that the liberal promise of perfectibility was central to the Christian message. Others, such as Francisco Sarco or the young Ignacio Bayarta, could do likewise, underscoring the degree to which Christianity brought equality, a renewed sense of human brotherhood and dignity, all allowing for the furthering of mankind and fundamental freedoms. A central pillar in this movement from late Bourbon to early national Mexico was the increasing emphasis on the ethical side of religion. To reformers in both the 18th and 19th centuries, at least up until the Reforma, religion must be lived through Christian morality and responsible citizenship more than through liturgy and customary practices, popularly understood to be pious, such as processions, feast day celebrations, or roadside altars. Bishops in their pastoral letters and parish priests in their sermons led the charge in this direction down to 1810. But in the 1810s, Jose Joaquin Fernandez de Lizardi had begun a discussion of such matters as, a proper, as proper Christian conduct, clerical impropriety, superstition, and mistaken censorship. Mexico was receiving spillover from the Cortes discussion of similar to topics between 1810 and 1814. And the Mexican press was re-editing controversial, controversial positions initially published in Spain. By the 1820s, a burgeoning Mexican editorial world was fueling newspaper and pamphlet discussions on these topics by broadening and deepening the re-edition of Spanish publications and by translating from the foreign press, especially from Italy and France, pieces which might foster one position or another among engaged people in Mexico. European experience was brought into the debate to favor the gradual convergence of liberalism and Catholicism or to suggest that political change and the pressures on the church had gone too far and endangered social stability and the ecclesiastical mission in society. Similarly, the foreign press could be brought to bear in the national arena in Mexico either to insist on the reform of clerical conduct and the promotion of an austere, saintly, and apolitical priesthood or to stir up support for more traditional devotions or, a, or a renewed piety generally more in line with them. As late as November of 1855, well-versed Mexican thinkers and politicians could express the need for improving on rather than abrogating the church-state alliance even while it was giving constant signs of not working. Francisco Sarco, who would be one of few to strongly advocate separation of church and state in the 1856 Constitu Constituent Congress, could state that clerical renewal, in an article, in a long article in, uh, in November of 1855, um, could state that clerical renewal was necessary to ameliorate ind ind indigence in Mexico, promote formal marriage among couples living out of wedlock, preach the gospel more compellingly, administer sacraments effectively, and generally attack superstition, immorality, and ignorance in religious matters. He openly frowned on women cloistered in convents and priests living comfor comfortably off chaplaincies in the major cities of Mexico. The men and women of the cloth should take to the countryside, the ranch towns, and other underprivileged areas where their charity was urgently needed to build the Christian nation. Oppositional Christian categories were fundamental to the construction of political affiliation and national identity in independent Mexico. Fray Servando Teresa de Mier, during the early insurgent period, insisted on the centrality of Fray Bartolomé de las Casas to the Christian heritage that Mexicans should value as the enduring legacy. 
In the decades after 1821, Las Casas, the early Christian friar living beyond his convent and in the community, serving and not lording, depriving himself of earthly goods, a family and ordinary comforts, was referred to as part of the reformer's liberal cultural baggage. The village priest of the day who put the emphasis on reconciliation, love, and education was referred to fondly. Cathedral canons, earthly, ambitious, and domineering priests were mentioned as going against the grain both of true Christianity and modern political liberties. Liturgy and Christian obedience to the church leaders dropped from common liberal reference. A brighter, more consensual, hopeful Christianity was set forth as the fundamental ideal of the modern believer. A liberal Christian citizen was acclaimed through what was remembered and expressed, and also what was forgotten or suppressed. By contrast, priestly hierarchy, liturgy, and more ordinary Catholic practices had to be defended more than extolled by ecclesiastical spokesmen. It, could, it would only be at mid-century that a new type of political Catholicism of a clearly, clearly conservative variety would consolidate. Several factors weighed heavily on this decision. The war with the United States, renewed revolutions, mm -hmm, uh, renewed revolutions in Europe, uh, and the decision by a sector of Mexico's elite to break with liberalism, denounce liberal constitutional constitutionalism as utopian, and to erect a cultural barrier against further United States encroachment. Built on the previous rumblings of institutional Catholic discontent based on the idea of the church as a perfect society and increasingly oriented to a papacy which had once been avoided, this political Catholicism was expounded in prominent newspapers like El Universal or La Cruz as an antidote to the long honeymoon of Mexico with liberalism and liberal Catholicism. The clergy, long left out of a clearly defined political equation, was now considered central to any enduring settlement. Internationally, Napoleon, Napoleon III was beginning his, his empire as the great mediator between past and present, church and state, faith and science, tradition and, and development. In 1850-51, the Falu law would, would, would hand new opportunities to French educa uh, in French education to the clergy. Pope Pius IX had surmounted his initial frustrating flirtation with liberalism and was on the road to his ultimate rejection of liberalism in all 19th century challenges to Catholic orthodoxy as established by the church hierarchy. The conservative Mexican elite, which was barely able to consolidate politically following defeat in war with the United States, was nonetheless decided to fit into this European authority-oriented legitimacy, which for 20 years would have its major center of gravity in France after the fall of Metternich in Austria in 1848. In this new setup, where the salvation of Mexico as a cultural as well as a political expression became foremost, what sort of church was viable, conjoined, subservient, or autonomous? The constant references to the centrality of Catholicism in Mexican identity, the lauding of the distinguished role of the clergy in Mexican history, and the desire to sign a concordat which would have recognized Mexico as a Catholic nation in good standing with the Vatican, all pointed toward a traditional equation of nation and faith or crown and altar. Yet the last dictatorship of Antonio Lopez de Santana was not characterized by clearly Catholic and providential discourse. Its dealing with the papacy were unsuccessful, and it was un unable to retain the participation of the powerful Clemente de Jesus Munguia in its government, Bishop of Michoacán. Thereafter, the Archbishop of Mexico, the bishops of San Luis Potosí, Guadalajara, and even Michoacán, Munguía, all made overtures toward the common fort government. Was it that the model of a progressive liberal Catholic settlement in Mexico could not be easily abandoned? Was there even sufficient dissidence within the ranks of the clergy to make this difficult? There is now information out on a large body of clergymen who were liberals. Had the liberal struggle to create a notion of national Catholic uh, unity based on a liberal understanding of the faith, so, something that, was it something that had simply made too much headway to be cast aside? I would like to suggest that these questions must be answered if we are to understand the many contradictions in Mexican 19th century history and the legacy it bequeathed to future generations.
What is clear is that the model of a conjoined destiny of institutional church and state was not to be easily mended. And the model of subservience was, an, uh, unac was as unacceptable to the church hierarchy as the model of autonomy or only voluntary association was to the founders of the state. In reality, that effectively only left separation, which had been sought by, by almost no one down to 1856 and was decisively rejected as a political so solution for the 1857 Constitution. But as so often happens in history, positions that hardened into insuperable oppositions without offering positive alternatives and ultimately pragmatism won out over political preference. Thank you very much. Matthew O'Hara is Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, he is the author of a recently published book, Duke University Press, called A Flock Divided, Race, Religion, and Politics in Mexico, 1749 to 1857. Thank you, Margaret. And let me thank not just Margaret, but certainly Charles and, and the Bancroft as a whole. It's um, a always a pleasure for me to come back here. I wrote my first research paper over in the Bancroft. And uh, while that document will remain in the O'Hara archive, <laughs> even though historians are all for open access, it's, it's always nice for me to come back to Berkeley. Um, I, I thought the best place to begin to explain this essay and, and the topic would be to describe a little bit about how I started working on the project. Um, I'm working on a new book, that I'm just getting going on, inspired in part by some very subjective, su suggestive essays by our own Claudio Lonitz that um, is trying to look at different practices of future making in an earlier period, in the colonial period and into the 19th century. And while I was working on grant proposals and trying to figure out my chapter outline, another colleague asked if I'd contribute a chapter to a volume on the history of emotions in the colonial period. And he said, pick whatever emotion you want. So I thought, okay, well, I'll try and kill two birds with one stone. What's an emotion that's future-oriented? So I, I settled on anxiety, which turned out to be very handy because though I said, oh, yeah, that deadline a few months from now, no problem, I'll, I'll hit that. Uh, <laughs> As that approached and then passed and then another one approached, I was, I was doing a kind of um, participatory research uh, on anxiety. Um, so when I finally got working on it, I, I began to look around the independence era, um, in part because my previous work had been on that moment or the, the period around independence. Um, and it also seemed, of course, an ideal moment to discover anxiety. And there was certainly a lot to be anxious about of course, uh, the independence era was maybe just a high point in a longer, century-long period of anxiety in New Spain and Mexico, running from 1750 to 1850, but even that's arbitrary, and we can think about so many moments that are causes for anxiety. So let me take a moment before I jump into the material to talk a little bit about the sources. Um, so I started looking at sermons and religious discourse from around the time of independence, and they're a, a, a quite useful way to begin this uh, examination of an emotion, certainly like anxiety, in part because they're such an important source of news at the time. And here I'm very indebted to the work of Brian Connaughton, certainly, and Carlos Erejon, and other people who have so masterfully used this, uh, uh, this documentary body. So a source of news. Uh, by 1810, late colonial period, New Spain, by all accounts, had a relatively modest print culture and so individuals of many different strata received their news often through the form of sermons, or that was one way, um, or other forms of oral communication. Um, sermons were one of the most important ways that news was circulated, not just uh, regional news, but transatlantic news, certainly, um, and we'll, we'll see that in this material. Now, to be a good academic, I have to build up my house, and then I have to tear it down again and try to rebuild it. There's great irony in describing these sermons and associated forms of religious discourse as a useful index of news in a society that was dominated by oral communication because the sermons, of course, that are available to us and that I've used are all in written form. Um, 
Um, typically, these sermons and other kinds of oration were published not long after their delivery, and they represent only a tiny fraction, of course, of the sermons that were published during the period, or I'm sorry, preached during the period. To make it into this select group meant some other things. It required the expense of typesetting and reproduction, um, also the approval of religious officials, and that usually meant that there's an extensive front matter with glosses on their orthodoxy, et cetera. As a result of all of this, it means that this body of, uh, of documents tends to represent certain viewpoints, not surprisingly, more than others. Um, Well-known Spanish priests typically were the people preaching these sermons, and they tend to project a conservative and almost always a royalist viewpoint and perspective. And we should also keep in mind that not for all, but for many of these sermons, the people who, it seems, were filling the pews for these special sermons were typically other Spaniards, sometimes of substantial wealth and status, rather than castas um, Indians or working people in general. Not always, but often. And finally, though we have general ideas about the composition of these audiences, our knowledge of how they responded specifically to these sermons is very limited and quite fragmentary. Now, before we give up on the sermons, uh, given these limitations, it seems perhaps implausible that we might examine an emotion or an emotional community surrounding these speech acts. After all, sermons seem to tell us a great deal about the emotions, values, and judgments of their authors, and in contrast, have relatively little to say about the emotional attitudes of the audience or the broader community, let alone any kind of effective, bond, effective bonds that might have existed between the members of that community. Um, however, I think we might want to, at, at this moment, pause and reconsider what was going on in the moment of the sermon. What's the relationship between the speaker and his audience? All of these sermons appealed to a broad and potentially universal community, the church militant, and a group, of course, that included both the preacher and his audience. The central practice of the church, the mass, was itself a ritualized performance of the church's collective labor, labor in the world. And this essentially collective enterprise of which the sermon formed a part opens up an interesting rhetorical space where the distinction between an author and an audience often collapsed even in a moment where the preacher might be exhorting his flock, pleading with them to do something, um, or even chastising them for their collective sins. In practical terms, this means that preachers often moved in and out of the first person and the third person, moving back and forth from the individual to the collective, from I to you to we, and in my case here, from personal anxiety to a kind of collective anxiety, maybe sometimes back to the personal again. Let me give an example of this. Um, I want you to consider a sermon that was preached in 1808 in Mexico City's Grand Cathedral by its archbishop at the time, Francisco Javier Lizana y Beaumont, just months after the Napoleonic invasion of Spain and the toppling of Ferdinand VII. Lizana y Beaumont equated Spain's plight to the Babylonian captivity of Israel. While the deposed Ferdinand VII found himself in literal captivity by the French, the Spanish people faced metaphorical captivity their true leader usurped by foreign invaders, and their interests now beholden to the French, those who another preacher called the assassins from the north. While one might rail against the crimes of the French, and this is common, you hear this in sermon after sermon, the archbishop in this case placed most of the blame on Spaniards themselves, and this is also a common trope. He opened the sermon with a dark quote from Ezekiel where the prophet warned that God would quote, make a desolation because the land is full of bloody crimes and the city is full of violence. So while providence and the exact flow of worldly events is ultimately unknowable, Lizana reminded his flock, Ezekiel's prophecy communi communicated quite clearly that God punishes us, quote again, God punishes us for our sins, and if we don't stop them, the punishments will only continue and increase. The sermon then built up to this moment of individual and collective catharsis ending in a collective prayer that clamored for God's mercy. Quote, I speak to you, the archbishop concluded, in the name of all my people. They all want to make peace with you. They all want mercy, and they all want you to pardon them for their faults. They all clamor from the bottom of their hearts, saying, and then it leads into a prayer, Father of mercies. Now here we see that kind of blending of the individual and collective in the rhetoric of the sermon. Now, to be a good academic, I have to tear the house down just one more time and then, then build it up again. 
I want to suggest that this kind of rhetoric, however, offers neither a very clear window onto the feelings of the orators and the writers, nor as a form of discourse can it be taken as the only evidence of the social reality of the time. Can we really know, for example, that the archbishop truly believed Spain's Babylonian captivity to be caused by Spanish sin, or Spanish sin alone, and therefore he truly fretted over those consequences? Or if so, are we sure in turn that his audience felt the intense anxiety that's clearly there in the text of, of his sermon? Both of those possibilities um, are plausible, of course, but I find it in this case much more useful to think about how the contents of sermons offer evidence of something that we might think of as the intersection between individual and collective experience. So what might be going on in this space between individual agency and collective sentiment? On the one hand, sermons during the independence era articulated and helped form a kind of anxiety that was based on collective fear. Other historians and other places have pointed out the very natural human tendency, and uh, more recently, cognitive psychologists have pointed this out. There's a natural tendency to convert anxiety into fear because in contrast to the very diffuse sense of anxiety and angst, uh, um, concern over the future, fear has an object, it can be acted on, and that uh, provides some kind of emotional comfort. But the conversion of anxiety into fear in New Spain around the time of independence, to me, only explains part of what's going on here, part of the emotional meaning of anxiety. Because uh, anxiety frequently coupled fear with some gestures towards certainty or confidence. This was crucial, because by blending fear and confidence, sermonists and their audiences gained purchase on what was clearly a very uncertain future. Um, Consider the sermon preached in 1809 in Puebla um, by Francisco Javier Conde Pineda. This was part of a devotional cycle of masses that was meant to secure divine favor given, again, the ongoing calamities in Spain. Like many religious orders, he opened with a biblical reference, this time from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, which promised God's help in a people's time of great need. He then discussed the emotional state that he hoped the sermon would help his audience achieve. He said, quote, I'm not trying to stir up your spirits, which are already so moved, but I do want to lift them out of the profound dismay and consternation that they've fallen into because of the unhappy news from Spain, end quote. Conde Pineda's remarks speak to the duality that's at the heart of emotional uh, communication. On the one hand, he's acting upon some pre-existing emotional register. There's clearly a latent anxiety in New Spain or in his audience in 1809. On the other hand, he's manipulating that emotion at the same time. He's altering it by the speech act that, um, that I'm relating. Um, okay, let me continue then. Conde Pineda went on to describe what he thought was the ideal anxiety for his audience. That depended on this audience's predisposition to believe in a future that was clearly defined by providence and tightly controlled by providence. So Conde Pineda continues, Confidence mixed with fear, he's arguing, offered the only effective response to the political uncertainty of the moment. He warned, quote, my sacred ministry prevents me from offering illusory prognostications. By itself, however, confidence in God isn't enough to free us from our ills. One must combine it with the fear of God. This gift from above, confidence, can't be severed from that virtue, the fear of God, nor that virtue from this gift, they're inseparable. Confidence alone will corrupt us, devolving into vain conceit, and fear alone would ruin us, plunging us into terrible despair. In two words, we approach the Lord with confidence and fear, with confidence aware of his infinite power and goodness, with fear aware of our utter weakness and malice. So, in this instance, Conde Pineda is making no major exhortation to his flock, no specific call to action, in part, of course, because most subjects in New Spain could do very little in 1809 to influence events on the other side of the Atlantic. But this model of anxiety that he is employing and is the most explicit in articulating, you see over and over again in sermons at the time. So what did this model accomplish? What did this framework accomplish? It's offering his listeners a way to interpret what's clearly a chaotic and potentially threatening series of events over which they had apparently, in this case, little control. On the other hand, 
Conde Pineda's sermon didn't simply bring those emotions into being. It also acted on pre-existing emotional registers that were shared um, broadly by his audience. So keeping these thoughts in mind, I've been reading other sermons from the time. Not surprisingly, many of them emphasize the grave dangers of a society that was divided along what we would call racial or ethnic lines. As a bridge across this rift, and especially in these sermons preached by Spaniards, whether Creole or Peninsular, um, as a way to shore up differences between Creole and Peninsular Spaniards, preachers suggested that Catholicism offered a solution to the dangers faced by New Spain because it, as Brian was discussing uh, just a moment ago, Catholicism was understood to precede and trump other categories of belonging. But what I'd like to emphasize is that preachers appealed to a shared sense of self, not only through a kind of abstract notion of Catholic affiliation, but through an interpretive practice and a tradition within Catholicism that we might think of as a kind of collective way of making a future. Preachers of the era gave present relationships and political predicaments a temporal depth through biblical references and then projected that present into a partially interpreted future. Uh, let me give an example of this briefly. In 1808, um, a preacher, Vicente Navarro, manipulated temporality, and what I mean by that is simply the, the human experience of time in this way, when he preached in Madrid following the Napoleonic invasion. The mass in the sermon celebrated a recent victory by Spanish troops, though at this point the outcome of the conflict, of course, remained very much in doubt. In this moment of crisis, Navarro offered his audience a glimpse into the future. Spain, he promised, quote, need not fear its utter destruction, end quote. At first glance, Navarro noted, the calamities faced by Spain and its monarch seemed utterly incomprehensible. There was no reason for it, and thus apparently offered no emotional guidance to his audience. But through biblical interpretation, he thought, and he, he suggested, the present could be understood. The hand of God of this great God, Navarro proclaimed, who with a mere glance can cut through centuries past and future, wanted to show us some 2,000 years ago in advance the tragic scenes that we've just experienced in our Spain. And he went on to say, just as the Israelites faced God's wrath on numerous occasions, so too did Spain suffer in the moment, but it could be consoled by the biblical precedent of a favored people's delivery from ruin. So like many of his fellow preachers, Navarro was leaning heavily on a, uh, on a particular form of biblical exegesis called typology, in which biblical events were interpreted as prefigurations of later occurrences. In theological readings confined just to the Bible itself, typology is used, used to explain how the Old Testament relates to and prefigures events in the New Testament. Always good to come prepared with a conclusion where I'll be heading uh, very briefly here. Um, okay. Um, so in these, in these kind of purely theological readings, typology is used to explain how the Old Testament relates to the New, where the Old Testament is thought to be a vast store of types that are eventually then um, articulated and fully formed in the New Testament's antitypes. However, there's a deep history in Catholicism and later in Protestantism of using typology not just to interpret the Bible and the past, but the present and even the future. This goes back at least to Joaquin de Fiore, who was so important for the Franciscan presence um, in Spanish America. And while few later writers would match the kind of elaborate typologies of Fiore and others, in less extreme applications, his method becomes very commonplace, very accepted, it becomes a kind of practical, a basic tool that people use to make sense of the present, but also to interpret the future, if only imperfectly. Okay, so excuse the disjuncture. I will skip over another example um, from after the independence movement breaks out in New Spain. So to conclude then, I, th I think it's obvious in the reading that I've done so far, and I wanna emphasize that this is still kind of preliminary, but it's very clear that preachers repeatedly described an intense uncertainty, an intense fear that gripped the transatlantic community of Spaniards, um, certainly beginning in 1808, and then in New Spain, this amplifies after 1810. As one preacher put it, Spaniards found themselves racked by, quote, cruel anxieties torn between hope and fear. These preachers described, in other words, a collective and a pervasive sense of anxiety, 
which unchecked, they argued, could lead to a kind of dithering or an inertia, and some of them described the danger of this. But preachers offered a solution to the temporal crisis presented by an uncertain future. Since anxiety relates to the future, whether the incessant bombardment of the immediate future or what lies much further ahead, the flow of time very much shapes our experience of anxiety. As we've seen throughout this period, preachers used uh, similar methods as they described uncertainty in its relationship to time. Most importantly, they explained past, present, and future through biblical analogy and precedent. After the events of 1808 and 1810, the future seemed to approach at a breathtaking, and indeed for many, a horrific pace. The acceleration of time, which included the ways that sermonists described the future, increased anxiety in New Spain. In turn, preachers converted a diffuse worry or unease into concrete fears about the dangers of political change, and certainly after the events at Guanajuato, after the dangers of a mass rebellion that's cross-cut by ethnic and racial difference. Then, however, they provided their audiences with a method through which one could rehabilitate some of the negative aspects of fear. This preacher, Conde Pineda, stated the matter clearly when he said that confidence mixed with fear was the only way out of this predicament, and it's the ideal emotional state to approach God. This pathway that he staked out and that others used was a common interpretive move. Um, essentially, they were historicizing current experiences. What I find more interesting is that they also futurized present experiences, and they futurized their audience's emotions. They explained contemporary events through a deep history of biblical typology, and then they tamed the uncertainty of the future, partially, through the reassurance of providential guidance. I'll leave it there, but, but what I'm struck by, uh, uh, again, by reading this, this initial body of sermons, and, and there's more places that I want to go to examine this topic, is that, in fact, through cultivating a certain form of anxiety with this interesting mix of fear and confidence, we see preachers and, I think, their audiences, or at least they're gesturing towards their audiences, groping towards what, of course, is always a very elusive future, but trying to come up with practical tools to deal with that. Thanks. Matthew Butler is Associate Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he is the author of Popular Piety and Political Identity in Mexico's Cristero Rebellion, Michoacán, 1927 to 1929. Uh, and like Matt and like Brian, he is the author of extremely useful and important and field-shaping uh, edited volumes. Thanks. Matthew Butler. Uh, well, thank you, Margaret. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, reiterate Brian and Matt's uh, thanks to uh, the organizers, to Margaret again, to Charles, and to, to Liz Gardner, who uh, took care of all the arrangements. Uh, uh, so thank you for the invitation uh, to come to this event. Um, I'm going to try and follow on perhaps a little from some of the ideas that Brian in particular uh, has been talking about, this, this idea of liberal Catholicism, and trying to uh, suggest that that idea still remained um, intriguing uh, and complex, even in the history of the, the Mexican Revolution. I want to begin with a document which is produced uh, by the, the, Mexican, the, the U.S. consul in Veracruz in March 1928, a man called Harold Wood. And it describes some fairly unusual religious developments which were taking place in Mexico at that time. Wood, of course, knew at that point that uh, Mexican Catholic hierarchy had suspended public religious worship across Mexico. There was a kind of religious strike at the time as a result of a feud between the episcopate and the regime of Plutarco Elias Calles. That had generated in many parts of the country a rebellion called the Cristero Rebellion uh, and also fierce outbreaks of persecution. While priests were in hiding, however, Wood had learned that a semi-official schismatic body calling itself the Mexican Catholic and Apostolic Church, Iglesia Católica Apostolica Mexicana, was busy proselytizing in rural Mexico, especially in the central and southern regions of the country. And he writes, 
Clergymen of the Mexican Catholic Apostolic Church during the past month have been conducting services at various places throughout the district of Puerto Mexico. Today that's, that's called Quetzalcoatlcos in Veracruz. Using for this purpose the Roman Catholic churches that were left in the care of local committees at the time the Roman Catholic clergy discontinued their services. It is said that the bishop and his priests are not graduates of any theological institution of learning, but are agents of the Mexican government sent to conduct services in order that the government may say there is no religious question in Mexico. However, the Mexican Catholic clergymen have conducted services such as baptisms, confirmations, and masses with great success. No trouble has arisen at Puerto Mexico between the Roman Catholics and Mexican Catholics. This would concluded was because Veracruz peasants are probably in the same intellectual stage of development as that in which their ancestors were found at the time of the conquest, and they are not concerned with questions of dogma or whether the services be conducted by Roman or Mexican Catholic clergymen. No religious or national questions take root in the minds of the inhabitants. That's an interesting document, I think, because uh, <coughs> it captures two particularly important points. Uh, regardless of the racializing trope that Wood mentions for us. First of all, that the revolution was a period of religious as well as socio-political ferment in Mexico. That's something which is still not appreciated, perhaps, even 15 years after Mexico's cultural history revisited 1910. Albeit crudely, Wood also glimpsed in the revolutionary schism a more dialectical relationship between Mexico's liberal and Catholic traditions. Though he attributed evidence of this synthesis, synthesis to ignorance, Wood saw that the revolution included a genuine religious experiment, not unlike the French Église Constitutionnelle or the living church pioneered by the Bolsheviks in the 1920s. This was perceptive, perhaps, in that few assumptions about Mexico's revolutionary history proved more enduring than the incompatibility of revolutionary and Catholic worldviews and institutions. Historians, it must be said, have tended to disagree uh, with many of these ideas and see the schism as a, more of a, a political ploy to divide Mexico's Catholics, like some tragic Henrician pantomime. But in fact, almost everything that is commonly supposed about the movement, that it was urban, ephemeral, ultimately contrived and secularizing, is substantially wrong. Firstly, I will argue, the schism enjoyed localized but genuine support, mainly again in southern and central parts of the countryside, and its churches could endure for years despite widespread opposition. Secondly, the schism was but really the latest in an attempt to reunite civic and religious outlooks in Mexico, this time by fusing Catholicism with strands of revolutionary ideology. It tapped into a vein of ecclesiological radicalism, as Brian has shown us, that dated from the late colony, but is somehow thought to disappear in the middle of Mexico's 19th century. That tradition of enlightened piety in Bourbon and liberal incarnation aimed to purify and harness Catholicism in the national interest, not to eliminate it, as we can see in novelas such as Christmas in the Mountains by Altamirano. The revolutionary schismatics invoked this ennobling prehistory and traced a lineage to the patriot churches founded by liberal state builders such as Melchor Ocampo. They also rehearsed the, the liberalism of the nation's founding fathers, Fray Servando uh, in particular, and the calls of reformist 18th century priests for a return to primitive church discipline. Even the proto-indigenismo of Las Casas featured in their pronouncements. Hence, creating a formed a reformed Catholicism is an established feature of Mexican radicalism, and revolutionary radicalism was no exception. It must be said that this evangelical impulse was shrouded in some fairly low religious politics, but I think it was still there. For one thing, uh, the cry for church reform was now made by a, a, a rustic and rather uh, discredited figure, the so-called patriarca José Joaquín Pérez Buda. At another level, we have to accept that the schism was partly a political provocation. Less than three months into the presidency of Calles, for example, Perez reopened a question about the meaning of being Mexican and being Catholic that exploded with theological fury, and he did so by invading the parish of La Soledad in Mexico City, a very provocative gesture. More controversially still, the schismatics received at times protection from Minister of Labor Morones and his regional confederation of Mexican labor, thus indirectly from the regime. So it's been too easy perhaps to dismiss them as pawns of the regime rather than as bearers of an ecclesial project or simply as ecclesiastical pariahs, which is how the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy viewed them at the time. Both of these claims are exaggerated. Short-lived official favoritism certainly did much to ruin relations between Roman Catholicism and the regime, lighting the fuse that would explode with the Cristeros in 1926. 
On the other hand, many revolutionaries too were enraged by Kayez's implicit violation of state agnosticism and his tacit endorsement of a national church. Uh, particularly Alvaro Obregón, who was the, 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 the maxima autoridad in Mexico at this time, uh, in April 1925, wrote a uh, very powerful letter to Cayes in which he warned him off this uh, strategy and told him that he wasn't going to Catholicize, uh, he wasn't going to revolutionize the church, he was going to Catholicize the revolution and divide it. Uh, so we can see after the first hundred days or so, uh, official support for the schism tends to, tends to dry up. And at that point, we see a movement which proceeds through a more petitionary, grassroots, and bottom-up approach. And in particular, we see hundreds of villages across central and southern Mexico requesting that uh, schismatic priests be sent in order to, to celebrate religious uh, events in their community, especially religious fiestas. It's also the case that most schismatics came from an identifiable substratum within the church, not a proverbial rotten barrel. Uh, amongst the ecclesiastical elites, only the archpriest of the Basilica of Guadalupe showed interest and even discussed his defection with Interior Minister Tejeda before getting cold feet. Most schismatics, by contrast, were poor parish priests with uninspiring livings, priests who suffered because of their liberal reputations or brushes with Episcopal authority. They were a bit like David Brading's clerical proletariat that he describes uh, for colonial mutual can. They may have been self-serving here, but such figures also tended to justify their decision to join Peles through appeals to Gallican-style patriotism and religious antiquity. Other times, they welcomed Perez's promise to improve their lowly structural position in the church, striking a blow against the pastoral privileges enjoyed by foreign clergy and bishops. Perez's church is also filled with real, if poor, congregations of Indians, agrarians, and peasants. The village appeal of this religious project suggests that there was more to it also than simple manipulation and bad faith and leads us, in, leads us instead to questions of institutional hegemony and popular politico-religious negotiation. In geographical terms, to start with, we note significant schismatic activity in a dozen or so states, especially in Hidalgo, Mexico, Puebla, Tlaxcala, Veracruz, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. The schism put down deepest roots in this central southern zone, which corresponds very well to Alan Knight's tripartite model of uh, a, a pink central zone of indigenous folk Catholic uh, Mexico contrasting the northern uh, Gulf red zone of religious radicalism and Protestantism and the white Cristero zone of the center west where there was a very orthodox model of religiosity uh, imposed. <clears throat> and I think if we look at the, the, the evidence we find really four or five factors that explain why uh, the schism appears in these uh, areas. First of all, there was the question of political utility to village or district bosses, to caciques, who found use for this religious project. Also, it appealed more or less to different clergies throughout Mexico. More importantly, we find an affinity between the schism and popular variants of liberalism and folk religion throughout Mexico, particularly festive cycles, uh, but also curative practice and even some syncretic devotions. Uh, and finally, we find the schism has a relevance to people involved in the land question, to the agrarian reform in Mexico. <clears throat> there is, in other words, a, a kind of schismatic uh, ecology, and for various reasons which tend to bond, we find people interested in this movement. At another level, a history of Perez's movement can offer historians unusual insights into the relationship between religious and political commitments in post-revolutionary Mexico. Given that church-state tensions frequently force people to choose between their political and religious convictions. Peasants who accepted government land or whose children went to godless SEP schools, for example, were often excommunicated, while priest-ridden pueblos that harbored cristeros were harassed by the regime or denied land. Thus, popular revolutionaries forfeited a confessional identity and accompanying socio-spiritual capital, while intransigent Roman Catholics were cast into a bureaucratic limbo, outcast from the revolutionary nation. This distinction between citizenship and faith forced many Catholics to resolve any contradiction between their religious and political aspirations inwardly. The problem for us is that their, their bargainings and wranglings leave us no trace. We know of dissembling in elite circles, but it's hard, as we've been hearing from, from Matthew, to get to uh, the question of how ordinary people interpreted their religious experiences in difficult times. The schismatic movement is significant, therefore, because it explicitly syncretizes diverse elements of popular culture, including folk religion, peasant nationalism, anti-clericalism, and agrarianism, agrarismo. Uh, 
The resulting hybrid shows how popular actors could pursue an in integral vision of revolution, which left room for the religious concerns that were usually excluded from mainstream revolutionary rhetoric. Like any religion, however, Mexican, Catho Mexican Catholicism was not one-dimensional. The schismatic hierarchy viewed their church as a pristinizing body, an inculcator of simple pieties and patriotic virtues, nationalism, civic, civic responsibility, industriousness, uh, and so on. But few village movements copied this template faithfully. Rather, we seem to find that the schism was metabolized in line with parochial interests and never represented an uncritical uh, representation of elite ideas. Firstly, the schism was a way for ordinary people to end the disenfranchisement of revolutionary agrarians, or agraristas, who were typically excommunicated by Catholic clergy. <coughs> Second, it brought groups who joined the movement monopoly over symbolic capital. Since, as I've said, from August 1926, Roman Catholic priests left their churches in protest against Kaiser's anti-clericalism. To register a schismatic was a way to regain control of parish churches, icons, uh, and so forth in a political religious coup. Thirdly, the schism deepened an emerging agrarista identity, gave it a kind of sectarian toughness, an edge which it didn't have before. Perhaps most instrumentally, it allowed Pueblos to advertise their loyalty to a regime, which was understandably keen to reward its supporters with grants of land, bearing in mind that it was facing a, a religious civil war. And finally, the schism meant religious liberty within certain parameters. Schismatics could celebrate religious acts that were illegal elsewhere, for starters. But also the social implications of Mexican rights were designed to be important. It was celebrated for free, uh, in Spanish, and in a spirit of religious and theological emancipation. So in sum, uh, this commitment to religious innovation and also to restoration, they're very keen on the idea of the mythical primitive church being recreated in Mexico, should make us wary, perhaps, of claims that the schism was merely political, and more broadly, that revolutionary anti-clericalism as a genre was necessarily or exclusively secularizing. On the contrary, this movement suggests that revolutionaries were occasion, on occasions locked in sectarian struggles with Roman Catholic clergy over religious purity, and that their anti-clericalism often had a rather apostolic character, not just, uh, not just putting the church out of business, so to speak, but go, forcing it to go back to spiritual basics, to uh, recover uh, a previous pure, supposedly pure incarnation. <clears throat> In this regard, Perez and his acolytes formulated a program that rested on an evangelical base. Schismatics invoked a golden age of early Christianity and used this model to attack Rome, Rome's usurpation of Christendom and its twisting of the faith. Roman rottenness, its departure from scripture and early church practice, had led it to abandon its mission and to set itself up as a worldly interest conspiring against the nation and the poor. This anti-clericalism, we can see, uh, in many ways parallels the official reading of revolutionary history, in which the clergy enfeebled Mexico and was the historical exploiter. Yet schismatics reached these conclusions from an entirely different perspective to revolutionary secularizers. They departed from a prelapsarian view of the church, not just uncritical belief in revolution or in progress. <clears throat> so the schismatics tried ultimately to promote a theistic idea of spiritual unity in Mexico. This vision involved not merely the transfer of spiritual capital from Roman Catholicism to a pro-revolutionary religious community, but a radicalization of Catholic religiosity itself. On the one hand, Perez promised to <coughs> revolutionize church discipline, preserve true doctrine, and restore ancient practice. At the same time, however, this would still be a Catholic vision. The schismatics insisted that they had changed true doctrine, not one iota. Above all, schismatics claimed that they would revolutionize Catholicism by reforming supposedly backward religious attitudes that threatened Mexico's economic progress and spiritual sovereignty. Uh, Latin liturgical formulae, clerical hostility to land reform, uh, the confessional box, religious taxes, all of these things which were supposed uh, obstacles to national consolidation. Uh, I just try to give you a, a flavor um, of this by, by reading you a, an extract from a sermon that was made by one of the schismatic priests, a man called Benigno Gomez, in the, the Church of Corpus Christi, which is now the Archivo de Notarias in Mexico City, if you, uh, if you, uh, if you know it. This was the, the, the cathedral of this movement for this time. Uh, he talked about the Church of Christ being the safeguard of love and peace, of brotherhood and moralization. All of the great virtues and heroism of the divine master should be there. Our action is in the breast of Jesus Christ's church. We come with the high ideal of the divine Nazarene. 
We wish to make our beloved fatherland great by means of love, peace, and through the fraternal leadership of Mexicans. We do not come to take away our compatriots' religious faith, but to give them the gift of love and the purity of immortal Christ. Free of all yoke and servitude beside that which we owe to God, we are here today at the feet of Jesus and the Most Holy Virgin to pray for our beloved patria, so that in her shall reign Christian peace, true peace, and the invincible love of Jesus. So at least on occasions, revolutionary anti-clericalism uh, could be conceived as part of an affirmation of what Catholicism ought to be. It presented a positive religious state rather than merely the negative uh, tropes that we're all familiar with. Core beliefs included uh, a belief in the properly harmonious coexistence of nations and churches in history, as Brian was discussing earlier on, a belief in the superiority of early Christianity and confidence in Catholicism's revolutionary potential, its association with social justice uh, and basic human quality and dignity. The relative local success of this church model suggests that the revolution could generate on occasion degrees of religious mobility <clears throat> and become even part of a confessional political identity mixing local religious and revolutionary practices. Uh, what I'd like to do in, the, in the, the, the five minutes that remain is just give you uh, a sense of some of the, the religious um, negotiations or approximations that occurred with this movement in uh, the countryside before I uh, reach a conclusion. A lot of the documentation we have about this movement comes from the agrarian reform archive. Uh, there was obviously a, an association between this movement and the agrarian reform, but there are properly religious reasons uh, that explain the regional distribution and the partial success that this movement had. Uh, first of all, the becoming schismatic allowed Mexican Catholics or Catholic Mexicans to become revolutionary whilst holding on to their Catholic beliefs. Mexican Catholicism was not a conversionist faith. It was more a primitive state, something that had to be recovered simply by removing the blinkers that Roman Catholic priests had historically placed over the flock's eyes. You didn't become a Mexican Catholic. In some sense, you became one again. You became a, 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 re, a rebirthed religious individual. Secondly, uh, the Reformed Catholicism was compatible with agrarianism. It allowed Catholics who would otherwise face religious reprisals for their revolutionary participation to act more freely. There was a sense of that it provided some moral color to agrarianism. Um, I've got a, a, an interesting quote from the village of Coyotepec in Mexico State where there was a very violent religious uh, and agrarian conflict. Uh, and it's a, a, an account produced of an incident in which federal troops and some of their, their Roman Catholic allies in the community uh, tried to repress the agrarian movement. In particular, they, they roped some individuals behind horses and dragged them across the, uh, the road and through thorn bushes. And there's a, there's a letter produced by the, the schismatics in that uh, community uh, in which they describe how this torture was performed without compassion, even though they pleaded for mercy. The families of the detained wept bitterly, the letter goes, as when the beloved mother of Jesu Christi cried for him, on seeing the agrarians punished for the simple fact that during this presidential period we were granted a handful of land which today gives us our children's daily bread. The agrarians also denounced clericalism's bloodthirsty vipers for violating our sacrosanct revolution. Here then was an agrarian passion with early Christian motifs, martyrs cut by thorns, serpents in the garden, sadistic troopers, Mary's tears on Calvary, daily bread, etc., all of which suggests that, at least at some level, revolutionary agrarians cultivated an identity as persecuted Christians to set themselves apart from their enemies. Religion here was something of a, a source of consolation. It's a sense of righteousness which derives from a partly religious source. Thirdly, there was a simple economic factor. The Mexican religion was free. It didn't cost anything. It was supposed to, uh, in that sense enhanced the economic nationalism of the regime by preventing money from fleeing, <coughs> uh, being funneled out of the country to Rome. But it also produced supposedly, uh, supposed radicalization in the relations between priests and their followers. There was supposed to be a more re-peasantized clergy, uh, a worker clergy, which collaborated in the fields and toiled alongside campesinos that relied on alms giving rather than religious taxes. And again, you can, I can give you details of all these uh, things from, from the documents. Finally, perhaps most importantly, <clears throat> the Mexican priesthood's institutional weakness led it to be tolerant of public festive religion and certain kinds of local religion. That was especially important in the context of the Cristero Revolt, where the church had removed itself from uh, indigenous communities, even communities where uh, the involvement of the clergy was not at a premium. 
where the priest was required once a year to celebrate a patron, feast, a patron saint's feast, for example. So the schism allowed those ritual cycles to continue. It was a kind of uh, uh, allowed for defense of local ontological systems, shall we say, uh, in the face of the political, uh, the high politics of the Cristero period. We also find that this tolerance of popular religion extends to uh, an acceptance of certain syncretic devotions. There are some very good examples, uh, for example, of how uh, the schism became associated with, with religious uh, and ethnic problems in communities, how it was used as a way of uh, institutionalizing certain religious beliefs. Um, a good example is from the village of Honotle in Puebla, where they had a, a stone virgin, which was a, a, a local icon, and it became uh, enshrined in the, the Mexican church, and it seemed to follow a, a particular kind of religious uh, and ethnic fault line in that community. In sum, recent scholarship conceptualizes the revolution as a hegemonic process in which the contours of the state were renegotiated between elite and popular actors. Yet often religion is viewed as an object of the revolution, merely a stumbling block to this process. The Mexican Catholic Church points to a more dynamic set of interactions between revolutionary politics and religion, and adds an additional layer of complexity in that it reveals a more triangulated set of negotiations between church, pueblo, and the state. From 1926, especially, peasants in numerous southern and central pueblos tried to negotiate a path through the minefield of religious politics at local level. And given the unusual opportunities presented by the church-state crisis, found ways to bargain their political loyalty for a measure of religious liberty. Thus, religion could form a part of popular revolutionary culture as opposed to simply burying the religious attitudes that were excluded from mainstream revolutionary ideology. This formula might have proved more attractive had the schism's inflammatory early tactics not offended so many Catholics, especially in the towns, and as one alienated Mexico's ecclesiastical elite. Even so, the schismatics' attempt to Christianize the revolution, ignored or despised by historians, attracted devotees in hitherto unexpected numbers and places, and sometimes for unexpected reasons. Thank you. Questions? Professor Carr. Green light. Very interesting uh, collection of, uh, of presentations. My, my question is to Matthew Butler, because it kind of brings back, your paper brings back sort of memories of several centuries ago when I was doing work on the Crom in Mexico City and came across material about this, this church and about what I thought was Bishop Perez, but I'm not sure whether he ever was elevated to the bishop. I actually passed some of that data on to, to Jean Mayer. I don't quite remember whether he made very much of that. But uh, on, the issue of, um, on the issue of transgression and nationalization of Catholic ritual, one thing I vaguely recall from that period, uh, this may be uh, just a piece of misinformation from the official church, was that um, uh, priests, some priests uh, during, uh, bapt in, during in baptism used uh, tequila and pulque sort of uh, in the baptismal font. And I'm, I'm just curious about sort of that, whether that's simply a piece of, uh, of mis misstatement uh, or whether in fact it speaks to, whether or not that's true, whether it speaks to a very conscious attempt to, to, to engage in what I suppose we could call revolutionary theater. Uh, while at the same time uh, nationalizing uh, ritual, um, I think there was there was an emphasis on a kind of uh, nationalistic liturgy. Um, they talked all the time about el, el, el idioma nacional, which is the kind of caista trope for Spanish, uh, even though it's Castilian, not Nahuatl or anything like that. Um, and that was very prominent uh, in their movement. Whether it extended to formal indigenista touches of, of that kind. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, th those, those are the, the, the legends which enshroud the movement. That n not only did they use uh, tequila in the mass, they also broke uh, dried tortillas instead of bread and all of this kind of thing. Uh, you don't find much evidence of that. Um, I think that there is, there is a, a black legend which surrounds this movement. Obviously, it was uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, was very militant, was very opposed to the regime, and it hated what was closest to it, which was, a, a, as far as it was concerned, a pseudo-Catholic um, aberration from within the ranks of the revolution. Um, so 
there is there is a there is a, a layer which you have to penetrate through, and I think really their their engagement with um, what you might call national or domestic manifestations of religiosity comes through this uh, this structural weakness that is built into the movement at the very beginning, which encourages it to become uh, sensitive to popular religious practices. Um, so I think it's more at that level rather than rather than theatrical things. Um, you do see in Mexico. Um, Perhaps it's slightly later, a kind of natural religion of humanity with baptisms with honey and sashes and all of this kind of thing, and, uh, socialist baptisms without priests. Um, I think really they're trying to uh, create a, a reformed model of religion, but the downward pressure of that on these peasant communities results in something more popular being generated. Um. This is on. I have a question for um, Matt O'Hara. Um, I, I thought your paper was really interesting, and I thought I might detect a certain prophetic element to some of the language that you quoted, and I was wondering if that was common or just in that, that one sermon, and, and the link between a prophetic mode and, and an anxious emotional community. Um, a lot of a lot of prophecy involves instilling anxiety or fear in people, um, but perhaps also managing it in some way. I don't know. So I'm, I'm curious about that element. Yeah, you, you put your finger right on something that you, you put your finger on something that I was wondering about as well when I started reading the essence and I was investigating the literature around it, surrounding surrounding uh, not just these sermons but prophecy in general, and um, be, because your your question. Um, begs the question, if it's prophecy, then why fret about it at all? Um, because there's very little that one can do about true prophecy. A and I think that my answer to that would be that it, it turns out that a, a, an understanding of the future tightly controlled by providence is very complementary and not irreconcilable with a notion that it requires still work in the present to achieve the providential future. Now, on, on some kind of theoretical level, that's, of course, contradictory. Right? But, but I think other scholars who, in, again, in different times and places, Keith Thomas most famously, have shown that this, this notion of providence being um, the ultimate engine of, of history or of the ultimate engine of time and change over time um, did not preclude, in early modern England, for example, the emergence of an intense anxiety about what to do in the immediate future and fretting and concern about how to manage one's affairs in the world. And so I see these preachers gesturing to that, again, theoretically inconsistent, but in practical terms, um, a very present contradiction between a notion of providence and, and what do we do to make sure that providence comes to pass. Um, and so a lot of these sermons are really then about a kind of emotional labor to get people behind a program of political action after 1810 or in a more abstract sense after 1808 uh, um, in order to achieve God's plan in the world. Um, and they, they're, they're pretty um, explicit about that. So, yeah, it's a great point. Professor Irwin. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the the panel, I was having some thoughts during the first two presentations, and then the third one, they kind of <coughs> crystallized uh, in uh, Matthew, uh, sorry, Butler. <coughs> Butler's. Uh, the three Irish uh, extraction folks up here <laughs> make it very hard to, to sort all of this out. Yeah. Um, discussion which, uh, or a presentation which in some, some ways came across as more robust to me in a way for its ability to move uh, more freely or, or move more really outside of the space of the, the lettered city to discuss the issues at hand of religion, politics, and armed rebellion. And so he was, of course, talking about a later time. And I'm wondering, and so I appreciated, for example, uh, Matthew O'Hara's uh, discussion of sources, the, the kind of critical approach to sermons. Um, but what are some of the challenges of trying to uh, understand the 19th century or late 18th century uh, <coughs> moving outside the context of the lettered, lettered city and understanding really what might, what kinds of heterodox thinking may have been going on that may have contributed to uh, either the independence movement or the, or the Mexican Revolution. Um, have you, uh, 
how much have you been able to do that in, in the, your projects, uh, Brian and Matthew O'Hara, and what have been some of the challenges in trying to do that? I have a, just a brief response. Uh, a quick answer, and then I'll turn it over to Brian. In my previous work, basically that's all I was trying to do, is reconstruct popular experience of religion and, um, and its relationship to politics. And, and since this is um, a new project, basically just took the path of least resistance and had these sources at hand. Um, but as I develop this chapter further, you know, I want to be thinking, uh, basically I want to triangulate the data a little bit, um, not to put it into social scientific terms. Um, but places that I might go on this immediate topic would be to look at heterodox sermons. There aren't a lot of them, even in the Inquisition files. It's, it's difficult to come across too many of them. But more kind of quotidian documents from parishes, reports from priests, things like that. Um, there, there's, from my previous work, I know that there's ample material expressing various sorts of fretting and concern about the future that are not just from this elite perspective. So in my case, I hope it's not too much of a pat answer, but basically I just need to run and, and, uh, and gather up some more of that kind of material from different perspectives. Um, <clears throat> well, it, I, I start with the sources. I, I think that um, Bill Taylor, I think, uh, tried to address that issue with his works on the 18th century, in particular, um, uh, Ministros de los Sagrado, uh, what does it say? Magistrates. Of the Magistrates of the Sacred. Um, and, and uh, what I've done in terms of getting beyond the lettered city, as you say, is to pick up on uh, his suggestions in those works uh, and to deal with plate those uh, disputes, legal disputes in the, in the, in the towns of the, uh, what I might have been working on is the Archbishopric of Mexico, right? And um, uh, those legal disputes tend to be, uh, as he discovered for the 18th century, very rich in terms of the possibilities of local people speaking because uh, they had to send someone in to um, uh, take testimonies, right? And so um, you, you begin to get a, get a view of towns to begin with, which are much more complex than at least I had envisioned previously um, because, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the 1820s and 30s and 40s, which is what I've been looking at, um, the, the towns tend to uh, have different types of people. I mean, it's an, it may be an Indian town uh, in terms of the majority of the population, but there's a, uh, some, there are some uh, retired militia officers. Some of them have fought in the War of Independence. Um, uh, the priest himself may have had some independence activities uh, which are reported on either uh, in, his, in favor of him or against him. Um, and there are, there are merchants, there are uh, independent farmers, uh, and, and there might be you know, some other individuals thrown in there, right? And so uh, in, in, the, in the disputes, the language tends to me uh, to seem very, very uh, uh, sort of like, it has many layers, right? And all of a sudden, they're talking about um, uh, religion in a certain way. For example, uh, they're often using, uh, uh, religious uh, appeals to uh, hit on the on, on the parish priest or to hit on uh, the um, the um, uh, the local alcalde, the village magistrate. Right? Uh, they've got they've got a notion that they use over and over again of uh, correct Christian and uh, conduct, which they tend to sort of uh, fold into citizen conduct, um, and uh, so uh, they're also. Uh, even though we have this notion of separation of church and state, uh, there is no such separation of church and state. Everything is, um, I, 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 I called people in these disputes feligreses ciudadanos, uh, sort of uh, uh, citizen parishioners or, right, uh, in, 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 in one study, because uh, everything is done through the ayuntamiento and uh, the, the, uh, the village council and almost all of these pleitos after independence. Uh, and even the church authorities go through the ayuntamiento. So uh, you're getting, you're getting this, uh, sort of a political, usually liberal political concepts feeding into the, uh, the religious questions. Um, and, and so uh, there are a lot of, that's, uh, lots of spin-offs there, right? For example, uh, the, the towns tend to divide. Uh, parish priests often get a group of people to sign documents in their favor after they've been accused by another. Uh, if they've been accused of uh, um, 
uh, ill conduct like uh, drinking, having a, uh, a concubine, etc. Um, they, they, in one case in 1824, they got people, the, the, the priest got people to sign who said they didn't really care about his private life. That was his own thing. He could do what he had to do, you know, but uh, 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 they were concerned that he administered the sacraments, and as long as he did that, he was a good priest. And so, you know, th there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things there that suggest that, that you know what the lettered city is percolating down and, and, and maybe percolating back up again you know and um, uh, in terms of another another sort of um, a document which uh, unfortunately we don't have much of but um, but Matt O'Hara uh, uh, knows this document well. Uh, there's a memoir of a priest of Iztacalco in 1831, 1832, uh, uh, which we're editing now, which should be out uh, within the next couple of months. And uh, he, does a, he does basically a study, you know, day by day of, of the situation in the city. And he talks about the attitudes of the people in the city towards the church, uh, towards him, uh, he talks, uh, for example, of a rumbling of sort of mockery against him, that there are, there are pamphlets circulating in Iztacalco, which is only a you know, mile or so out of Mexico City, but it's on, a, it's on, it's, it's on a, one of these uh, canals, you know, back, back when he's dealing with it. And uh, so it's not, you know, in the city by any, 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 any sense. Um, but, uh, but the folletos, you know, the pamphlets are getting in there, and, and this is having spin off against him, according to his, his reading. So it's, um, I, I, think if we, I think there is room to push ahead on this, uh, but there's still an awful lot of work that has to be done. And I think that the, the pueblos are much more in the midst of discussion than we have normally supposed. I'm sorry if I, I'm sorry if I've spoken too long. <laughs> the bells have rung. Okay, so Charles, you want to tell us what our plan is? Well, our plan is we assemble here at uh, 1.30, so you've got an hour and a half for lunch. Uh, despite what it says in the back of the program, the faculty club is open for lunch today. They open it up because we have a football game. There's a lot of people here. Uh, the game will start in about half an hour, so the, it should be opening. Uh, as we, uh, the crowd should be leaving. Um, so uh, another... Terrific session, and I look back to look forward to seeing you again.